Julius Caesar, Part Two of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part Two, Paragraphs Twenty to Thirty Three. Having entered upon his office, he introduced a new regulation that the daily acts both of the Senate and people should be committed to writing and published. He also revived an old custom that an officer should precede him and his lictors follow him on the alternate months when the fasces were not carried before him. Upon preferring a bill to the people for the division of some public lands, he was opposed by his colleague, whom he violently drove out of the forum. Next day the insulted consul made a complaint in the Senate of this treatment, but such was the consternation that no one having the courage to bring the matter forward or move a censure which had been often done under outrages of less importance, he was so much dispirited that until the expiration of his office he never stirred from home, and did nothing but issue edicts to obstruct his colleague's proceedings. From that time, therefore, Caesar had the sole management of public affairs, insomuch that some wags, when they signed any instrument as witnesses, did not add, in the consulship of Caesar and Bibulus, but of Julius and Caesar, putting the same person down twice under his name and surname. The following verses, likewise, were currently repeated on this occasion. Non Bibulo quid quam nuper, sed Caesare factum est, nam Bibulo fieri consule nil memini. Nothing was done in Bibulus's year. No, Caesar only then was consul here. The land of Stellas, consecrated by our ancestors to the gods, with some other lands in Campania left subject to tribute for the support of the expenses of the government, he divided, but not by lot, among upwards of twenty thousand freemen, who had each of them three or more children. He eased the publicans, upon their petition, of a third part of the sum which they had engaged to pay into the public treasury, and openly admonished them not to bid so extravagantly upon the next occasion. He made various profuse grants to meet the wishes of others, no one opposing him, or if any such attempt was made it was soon suppressed. Marcus Cato, who interrupted him in his proceedings, he ordered to be dragged out of the Senate House by a lictor and carried to prison. Lucius Lucullus, likewise, for opposing him with some warmth, he so terrified with the apprehension of being criminated, that, to deprecate the consul's resentment, he fell on his knees. And upon Cicero's lamenting in some trial the miserable condition of the times, he the very same day, by nine o'clock, transferred his enemy, Publius Clodius, from a patrician to a plebeian family, a change which he had long solicited in vain. At last, effectually to intimidate all those of the opposite party, he by great rewards prevailed upon Vetchus to declare that he had been solicited by certain persons to assassinate Pompey, and when he was brought before the rostra to name those who had been concerted between them, after naming one or two to no purpose, not without great suspicion of subornation, Caesar, despairing of success in this rash stratagem, is supposed to have taken off his informer by poison. About the same time he married Calpurnia, the daughter of Lucius Piso, who was to succeed him in the consulship, and gave his own daughter Julia to Cnaeus Pompey, rejecting Servilius Scipio, to whom she had been contracted, and by whose means chiefly he had but a little before baffled Bibulus. After this new alliance, 
he began, upon any debates in the Senate, to ask Pompey's opinion first, whereas he used before to give that distinction to Marcus Crassus, and it was the usual practice for the consul to observe throughout the year the method of consulting the Senate which he had adopted on the calends, the first, of January. Being therefore now supported by the interest of his father-in-law and son-in-law, of all the provinces he made choice of Gaul as most likely to furnish him with matter and occasion for triumphs. At first, indeed, he received only Cisalpine Gaul, with the addition of Illyricum, by a decree proposed by Vatinius to the people, but soon afterwards obtained from the Senate Gallia Cometa also, the senators being apprehensive that if they should refuse it him, that province also would be granted him by the people. Elated now with his success, he could not refrain from boasting a few days afterwards in a full senate house that he had, in spite of his enemies and to their great mortification, obtained all he desired, and that for the future he would make them, to their shame, submissive to his pleasure. One of the senators observing sarcastically, "'That will not be very easy for a woman to do,' He jocosely replied, Semiramis formerly reigned in Assyria, and the Amazons possessed great part of Asia. When the term of his consulship had expired, upon a motion being made in the Senate by Gaius Memmius and Lucius Domitius, the praetors, respecting the transactions of the year past, he offered to refer himself to the house. But they, declining the business, after three days spent in vain altercation, he set out for his province. Immediately, however, his quaestor was charged with several misdemeanours for the purpose of implicating Caesar himself. Indeed, an accusation was soon after preferred against him by Lucius Antistius, tribune of the people. But by making an appeal to the tribune's colleagues, he succeeded in having the prosecution suspended during his absence in the service of the state. To secure himself, therefore, for the time to come, he was particularly careful to secure the good will of the magistrates at the annual elections, assisting none of the candidates with his interest, nor suffering any persons to be advanced to any office who would not positively undertake to defend him in his absence for which purpose he made no scruple to require of some of them an oath and even a written obligation. But when Lucius Domitius became a candidate for the consulship, and openly threatened that, upon his being elected consul, he would effect that which he could not accomplish when he was praetor, and divest him of the command of the armies, he sent for Crassus and Pompey to Lucca, a city in his province, and pressed them for the purpose of disappointing Domitius to sue again for the consulship, and to continue him in his command for five years longer, with both which requisitions they complied. Presumptuous now from his success, he added at his own private charge more legions to those which he had received from the Republic among the former of which was one levied in Transalpine Gaul, and called by a Gallic name a lauder, which he trained and armed in the Roman fashion, and afterwards conferred on it the freedom of the city. From this period he declined no occasion of war, however unjust and dangerous, attacking without any provocation as well the allies of Rome as the barbarous nations which were its enemies, insomuch that the Senate passed a decree for sending commissioners to examine into the condition of Gaul, and some members even proposed that he should be delivered up to the enemy. But so great had been the success of his enterprises that he had the honour of obtaining more days of supplication, and those more frequently, than had ever before been decreed to any commander. During nine years in which he held the government of the province, 
his achievements were as follows. He reduced all Gaul, bounded by the Pyrenean forest, the Alps, Mount Gibena, and the two rivers, the Rhine and the Rhone, and being about 3,200 miles in compass, into the form of a province, excepting only the nations in alliance with the Republic, and such as had merited his favour, imposing upon this new acquisition an annual tribute of forty millions of sesterces. He was the first of the Romans who, crossing the Rhine by a bridge, attacked the Germanic tribes inhabiting the country beyond that river, whom he defeated in several engagements. He also invaded the Britons, a people formerly unknown, and, having vanquished them, exacted from them contributions and hostages. Amidst such a series of successes, he experienced thrice only any signal disaster. Once in Britain, when his fleet was nearly wrecked in a storm, in Gaul at Jagovia, where one of his legions was put to the rout, and in the territory of the Germans his lieutenants, Titurius and Arunculius, were cut off by an ambuscade. During this period he lost his mother, whose death was followed by that of his daughter, and, not long afterwards, of his granddaughter. Meanwhile the Republic being in consternation at the murder of Publius Clodius, and the Senate passing a vote that only one consul, namely Gnaeus Pompeius, should be chosen for the ensuing year, he prevailed with the tribunes of the people, who intended joining him in nomination with Pompey, to propose to the people a bill enabling him, though absent, to become a candidate for his second consulship, when the term of his command should be near expiring, that he might not be obliged on that account to quit his province too soon, and before the conclusion of the war. Having attained this object, carrying his views still higher, and animated with the hopes of success, he omitted no opportunity of gaining universal favour by acts of liberality and kindness to individuals, both in public and private. With money raised from the spoils of the war, he began to construct a new forum, the ground plot of which cost him above a hundred millions of sesterces. He promised the people a public entertainment of gladiators, and a feast in memory of his daughter, such as no one before him had ever given. The more to raise their expectations on this occasion, although he had agreed with victuallers of all denominations for his feast, he made yet farther preparations in private houses. He issued an order that the most celebrated gladiators, if at any time during the combat they incurred the displeasure of the public, should be immediately carried off by force and reserved for some future occasion. Young gladiators he trained up, not in the school and by the masters of defence, but in the houses of Roman knights and even senators skilled in the use of arms, earnestly requesting them, as appears from his letters, to undertake the discipline of those novitiates, and to give them the word during their exercises. He doubled the pay of the legions in perpetuity, allowing them likewise corn when it was in plenty, without any restriction, and sometimes distributing to every soldier in his army a slave and a portion of land. To maintain his alliance and good understanding with Pompey, he offered him in marriage his sister's granddaughter Octavia, who had been married to Gaius Marcellus, and requested for himself his daughter, lately contracted to Forster Scylla. Every person about him, and a great part likewise of the Senate, he secured by loans of money at low interest, or none at all and to all others who came to wait upon him, either by invitation or of their own accord, he made liberal presents, not neglecting even the freedmen and slaves who were favourites with their masters and patrons. 
he offered also singular and ready aid to all who were under prosecution or in debt, and to prodigal youths, excluding from his bounty those only who were so deeply plunged in guilt, poverty, or luxury, that it was impossible effectually to relieve them. These, he openly declared, could derive no benefit from any other means than a civil war. He endeavoured with equal assiduity to engage in his interest princes and provinces in every part of the world, presenting some with thousands of captives, and sending to others the assistance of troops, at whatever time and place they desired, without any authority from either the senate or people of Rome. He likewise embellished with magnificent public buildings the most powerful cities not only of Italy, Gaul, and Spain, but of Greece and Asia, until all people, being now astonished, and speculating on the obvious tendency of these proceedings, Claudius Marcellus, the consul, declaring first by proclamation that he intended to propose a measure of the utmost importance to the state, made a motion in the senate that some person should be appointed to succeed Caesar in his province before the term of his command was expired, because the war was being brought to a conclusion, peace was restored, and the victorious army ought to be disbanded. He further moved that Caesar being absent, his claims to be a candidate at the next election of consuls should not be admitted, as Pompey himself had afterwards abrogated that privilege by a decree of the people. The fact was that Pompey, in his law relating to the choice of chief magistrates, had forgot to accept Caesar in the article in which he declared all such as were not present incapable of being candidates for any office. But soon afterwards, when the law was inscribed on brass and deposited in the treasury, he corrected his mistake. Marcellus, not content with depriving Caesar of his provinces and the privilege intended him by Pompey, likewise moved the Senate that the freedom of the city should be taken from those colonists whom, by the Vatinian law, he had settled at New Como, because it had been conferred upon them with ambitious views and by a stretch of the laws. Roused by these proceedings, and thinking, as he was often heard to say, that it would be a more difficult enterprise to reduce him, now that he was the chief man in the state, from the first rank of citizens to the second, than from the second to the lowest of all, Caesar made a vigorous opposition to the measure, partly by means of the tribunes who interposed in his behalf, and partly through Servius Sulpicius, the other consul. The following year, likewise, when Gaius Marcellus, who succeeded his cousin Marcus in the consulship, pursued the same course, Caesar, by means of an immense bribe, engaged in his defence Emilius Paulus, the other consul, and Gaius Curio, the most violent of the tribunes but finding the opposition obstinately bent against him, and that the consuls elect were also of that party, he wrote a letter to the senate, requesting that they would not deprive him of the privilege kindly granted him by the people, or else that the other generals should resign the command of their armies as well as himself. Fully persuaded, as it is thought, that he could more easily collect his veteran soldiers whenever he pleased, than Pompey could his new raised troops. At the same time he made his adversaries an offer to disband eight of his legions, and give up Transalpine Gaul, upon condition that he might retain two legions with the Cisalpine province, or but one legion with Illyricum, until he should be elected consul. But as the Senate declined to interpose in the business, and his enemies declared that they would enter into no compromise where the safety of the Republic was at stake, he advanced into hither Gaul, and, having gone the circuit for the administration of justice, 
made a halt at Ravenna, resolved to have recourse to arms if the Senate should proceed to extremity against the tribunes of the people who had espoused his cause. This was indeed his pretext for the civil war, but it is supposed that there were other motives for his conduct. Cnaeus Pompey used frequently to say that he sought to throw everything into confusion because he was unable, with all his private wealth, to complete the works he had begun, and answer at his return the vast expectations which he had excited in the people. Others pretend that he was apprehensive of being called to account for what he had done in his first consulship, contrary to the auspices, laws, and the protests of the tribunes. Marcus Cato having sometimes declared, and that too with an oath, that he would prefer an impeachment against him as soon as he disbanded his army. A report likewise prevailed that if he returned as a private person, he would, like Milo, have to plead his cause before the judges surrounded by armed men. This conjecture is rendered highly probable by Asinius Pollio, who informs us that Caesar, upon viewing the vanquished and slaughtered enemy in the field of Pharsalia, expressed himself in these very words. This was their intention. I, Gaius Caesar, after all the great achievements I had performed, must have been condemned had I not summoned the army to my aid. Some think that, having contracted from long habit an extraordinary love of power, and having weighed his own and his enemy's strength, he embraced that occasion of usurping the supreme power, which indeed he had coveted from the time of his youth. This seems to have been the opinion entertained by Cicero, who tells us in the third book of his offices that Caesar used to have frequently in his mouth two verses of Euripides, which he thus translates. Nam si violandum est jus, regnam di gratia violandum est, aliis rebus pietatem collas. Be just, unless a kingdom tempts to break the laws, for sovereign power alone can justify the cause. When intelligence, therefore, was received that the interposition of the tribunes in his favour had been utterly rejected, and that they themselves had fled from the city, he immediately sent forward some cohorts, but privately, to prevent any suspicion of his design, and, to keep up appearances, attended at a public spectacle, examined the model of a fencing school which he proposed to build, and, as usual, sat down to table with a numerous party of his friends. But after sunset, mules being put to his carriage from a neighbouring mill, he set forward on his journey with all possible privacy and a small retinue. The lights going out, he lost his way, and wandered about a long time, until at length, by the help of a guide, whom he found towards daybreak, he proceeded on foot through some narrow paths, and again reached the road. Coming up with his troops on the banks of the Rubicon, which was the boundary of his province, he halted for a while, and, revolving in his mind the importance of the step he was on the point of taking, he turned to those about him and said, We may still retreat, but if we pass this little bridge, nothing is left for us but to fight it out in arms. While he was thus hesitating, the following incident occurred. A person remarkable for his noble mien and graceful aspect appeared close at hand, sitting and playing upon a pipe. When not only the shepherds but a number of soldiers also flocked from their posts to listen to him, and some trumpeters among them, he snatched a trumpet from one of them, ran to the river with it, and sounding the advance with a piercing blast, crossed to the other side. 
Upon this Caesar exclaimed, Let us go whither the omens of the gods and the iniquity of our enemies call us. The die is now cast. Accordingly, having marched his army over the river, he showed them the tribunes of the people, who, upon their being driven from the city, had come to meet him, and in the presence of that assembly called upon the troops to pledge him their fidelity, with tears in his eyes, and his garment rent from his bosom. It has been supposed that upon this occasion he promised to every soldier a knight's estate, but that opinion is founded on a mistake. For when in his harangue to them he frequently held out a finger of his left hand, and declared that to recompense those who should support him in the defence of his honour, he would willingly part even with his ring, the soldiers at a distance, who could more easily see than hear him while he spoke, formed their conception of what he said by the eye, not by the ear, and accordingly gave out that he had promised to each of them the privilege of wearing the gold ring, and an estate of four hundred thousand sesterces. End of Julius Caesar, Part 2 Recording by Graham Redman